Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Liz Peace, and I'm Chair of Trustees at the Centre for London. Uh, I also happen to be Chairman of Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation, uh, so I shall appreciate, have a particular interest in the subject uh, that we uh, are discussing this afternoon. Uh, this is the, the launch of the report from our Industrial Land Commission, which was a big piece of work that we've done at the Centre for London, looking at how we can make the best use of limited available land in London to meet the needs, the manufacturing and industrial needs of our city. Now, just a little bit about Centre for London, for those of you who don't know us, we are London's dedicated think tank. We do events, we do conferences, um, and we produce research and do events based around that research with the aim of tackling or getting a debate going on a whole lot of London's really big challenges. And we all love London, but we know that London as a city does have challenges, and we think it's really important that those are properly debated by the people who care about it and the people who can influence what happens. Now, back in March 2021, feels like a lifetime ago, uh, the Centre for London decided to convene an independent expert-led commission. This is more than just doing research. This is actually getting together a group of experts uh, to debate this hot topic of our industrial land. What is actually happening to it? Is it disappearing too quickly? What do we need to do to protect it? Uh, I was uh, delighted to be asked to chair this. Uh, I'm passionately interested in the subject of industrial land. I am actually a Brummie. Uh, I grew up living next to quite a large factory in Birmingham where they have to make chocolate. Uh, I also know an awful lot about what was Birmingham's industrial land and how incredibly important that has been in the development of Birmingham as a city. Now, with my involvement in Old Oak and Park Royal, I can see how essential uh, the activities that take place in Park Royal are to the success of London. And for Park Royal, there are also a myriad of other sites around our city, which are absolutely crucial to its success. But our industrial land is under great pressure. Uh, we're going to explore more of that in this afternoon's webinar. Uh, and there is a danger that that industrial land is sort of going to disappear almost by default. It's the purpose of our commission to shine a spotlight on this issue, to start thinking about what the potential solutions are to the disappearance of that industrial land, how we actually protect it for the future. Now, a huge amount of the work on this commission was done by uh, Nico Bassetti, who's going to be talking to us this afternoon and giving us the, an, an outline of our findings. But I also just want to acknowledge the work of, of Nikita Kashi, um, who has now left the Centre for London, but who worked with us initially on this. And of course, one of our uh, key um, senior staff, Rob Whitehead. We've also been doing this project sufficiently long that a number of other people who are no longer with us also had a hand in setting it up. So I'd like to shout out to Jack Brown, Richard Brown, uh, and of course, Ben Rogers, um, our previous director at the Centre, Centre for London. It's a huge amount um, to set it up. Sorry, just being told recordings in progress. So it was slight, a slight distraction. Um, I've had a huge amount of pleasure working with the, the Centre for London team on this uh, and indeed with the rest of the commissioners who were listed in our report. Uh, and I'm very grateful to everybody who devoted so much time to this. Um, of course, we couldn't have actually completed this significant piece of work without a considerable amount of support from our sponsors. Seagrove, Be First from the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham and also the London Boroughs of Brent, Ealing, Enfield and Southwark. We'll be hearing a bit more from the London Borough of Enfield later. Right, so um, I'm going to run through a bit of the housekeeping for this afternoon so you can see what we're trying to do and, and also give you a few tips on how to interact with what we're doing. As I mentioned, Nico, um, who's our, been our research mastermind on this, will shortly be presenting the top headlines and recommendations from the research. That should run on to about quarter past. We'll then introduce an expert panel and open up a discussion to get the initial reactions from a range of different perspectives. Um, we will then also um, open to questions from our audience, and get the panel to respond to those questions. I'll come back to how to do that in a moment. Um, the event is being streamed publicly on our YouTube channel uh, and it will be saved for further viewing. So if you don't get enough of it this time around, you can watch it all over again. Now, you can use the chat while all this is going on to actually exchange views, 
Um, because I find I can only do one or two things at once, not three, I'm not going to monitor the chat. Um, but what I will be looking at is the Q&A function. So if you want to put a question down, get in there and put your question down. I think we're gonna, that's going to be open pretty much as soon as Nico uh, starts talking. And our team are also going to monitor the chat and see whether there's anything in there we should be elevating to the, the question um, box as well. You can also vote for questions. Uh, so if you think somebody's asked a really good one, I think you can put a little hands up or clapping symbol next to it and that, that will elevate it. There's also going to be a live discussion happening on social media. You need to use the hashtag Industrial London. So hashtag Industrial London. And, and my piece of paper in front of me has initial caps for that Industrial London. I don't know whether that's significant, but that's probably how you should do it. Uh, if you've got any trouble with the Zoom webinar, as I said, we're also streaming live on YouTube, so you can connect with us via that. And uh, you could also, you can view that on our website at centreforlondon.org. So plenty of opportunities to make sure you're actually connecting with us and you can give us our views. And I really hope you will, because I'd like to make our panel discussion once Nico's finished uh, as interactive as possible and get to as much of what our audience is saying as we possibly can. So without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Nico, who's going to present our report, Making Space, Accommodating London's Industrial Future. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, I'm just about to share my slides. And before I start, um, can I um, extend my thanks to the Commission and to Liz? Uh, it's been a huge privilege to be part of such interesting discussion and expert opinions about industrial land. Um, and I really hope that this, this report does them justice. Right. So I'm going to be rushing through the, the content of the report. Of course, there's a lot more in it. So please forgive me if I leave some of the content behind, but please do have a look afterwards. I will start um, with some definitions. Um, and to say that industrial land is, um, one type of land use um, in the planning system, but it covers very many different activities. And uh, these range from what might one might think as more traditional industrial, such as manufacturing. Uh, and this can be uh, you know, the famous golden syrup Titan Light factory in the Royal Docks, um, ranging all the way to uh, theater prop making uh, in, in parts of outer London. Industrial land also covers a lot of our infrastructure, uh, which is essential to the workings of the city. This includes water treatment centers, um, waste tra treatment centers, uh, but also bus garages and, um, and freight depots. And it also covers a lot of activities that um, one might not at all think would be industrial. Uh, this can be printing or the activities that service London services, um, but also film studios, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, after this, um, or even parties, there have been a lot of parties happening in warehouses on London's industrial land, London is famous for that. Um, and as a result of this diversity of activities, um, what industrial land looks like is also can be also very different. It's not just large sheds, uh, but also smaller spaces, uh, which can be nestled uh, in London's high streets uh, without you noticing them. The majority of industrial land in London is designated by city hall and boroughs, but they can release it, uh, so it doesn't have to be used as industrial land anymore. They can also designate more. Um, however, over the last two decades, the trend has very much been towards release. Um, as you can see on this chart, London is the orange line uh, and uh, the city has lost overall uh, just under 25% of its industrial floor space since 2000. That release has been a lot steeper in inner London boroughs uh, and lower in outer London boroughs. Uh, and that's a reflection of a really big policy decision uh, to use industrial land, uh, whether disused or not, 
uh, to build uh, more housing for London's growing population uh, and to create infrastructure to support this growth. However, the Commission has come to the clear conclusion that we can no longer do, th do this, and that's because um, there's just not enough industrial space in London to act as this reservoir of land that can be used for other uses. So uh, one example here is that vacancy rates uh, have fallen from 16% in 2001 to 4% in 2021. Now 4% may sound fine, uh, but experts actually say it's already too little uh, and it's an average across London. So um, it will be much lower, for instance, for buildings that are vacant or in inner London. And it's even more low, lower if you um, consider that users will have very different needs. It's no use telling a hot food delivery company that there's space available for them in Havering if they're trying to supply customers in Hammersmith. There's also been in the last couple of years a real boom in online retail and deliveries. Um, and these have put a lot more demand on London's industrial spaces. As a result of these two trends, um, industrial land values have soared uh, quite astoundingly. Uh, so uh, for instance, in, in Park Royal, which is um, a very large um, industrial estate in West London, land values have increased from 2.5 um, million pounds to 7 million pounds per acre uh, in the, just in the last three years. And um, some, some businesses and sectors are, can, can afford this and meet these higher costs. Uh, and in fact, are driving, driving up this increase, but others are being squeezed out. Uh, for instance, sectors such as repair and recycling. Um, and this is a worry because they had huge value to the city. The report uh, details what this value looks like um, and makes a really strong case that the city needs industrial land to function and to prosper. Um, and kind of looked at this through four lenses, the economy, employment, environment, and innovation and creativity. In terms of economy, um, if you look at the main sectors which tend to operate on industrial land, together they represent around 16% of London's uh, GVA. Um, but industrial land supports practically every sector in London's economy, so indirectly it has huge economic benefits. Industrial uh, land also, for instance, um, offers space for tradespeople to store materials, to build our homes, uh, for waste trucks to sleep at night, for data centers to allow professional services to operate. So this is just a kind of few examples of, uh, of that supporting every sector. It's also a big source of jobs. Um, we calculated around 11% of London's employment, but it's also a major source of local jobs. Uh, often located uh, outside central London uh, and jobs that are offered at a range of skill levels. It's also going to be really difficult to meet our net zero carbon commitments uh, with our industrial land. Just to give one example of this, we all know it's better for air pollution and carbon emissions if parcels are delivered on cargo bikes, uh, but this won't work if the closest depot they, they can access is located in Kent. So there needs to be space locally to unpack deliveries from, from lorries and divide them into smaller loads. And finally, this is a, a, a more of a fine-tuned point, but industrial spaces also act as incubators for startups in a very wide range of fields, uh, from a tailor graduating from one of London's prestigious fashion universities and looking for cheap space, to a biomanufacturing company that's testing out ideas uh, that could potentially transform the construction industry. Um, these are really looking for space in London, and London is um, kind of a center for kind of high skill industrial um, economy. There are other links I could go on for ages. I will stop here. But another key point is that Londoners are taking relatively little notice um, of this, and myself included, before starting on this research. We're often not aware of the ways that we rely on industrial land. Uh, or we feel less personally connected to it uh, than, for instance, the need for more housing. But as we've seen, it's, um, it's obvious that the city will need both more homes and industrial space uh, for homes to be built. So the Commission um, has been um, looking at how we can 
solves these issues. Uh, we've seen that there are problems with industrial land in London and that most of them are because there's a lot less of it than there was. Um, and this is the following course of action that the commission has started. Has started. Um, first, to give industrial land occupiers more influence uh, to avoid them being at the losing end of the planning system. Then improving evidence uh, to inform our decisions on land use, as well as enhancing how we make decisions about um, what should be protected and what should be released. Um, we also should make better use of uh, the existing industrial land through intensification. That, that means getting more value out of the same amount of space. There are also opportunities to make co-location work better. This is when industrial activities are located near or in the same building as other users, such as housing or offices. And finally, there are um, some ways that we can improve strategic planning across the wider southeast, because of course, um, London's economy relies on industrial land that's also beyond the M25. So we'll go through this in turn now. Um, the first one about giving industrial land occupiers more influence. Um, there are a range of recommendations attached to this. Um, and to some uh, commissioners, this was really, you know, trying to fixing in the, the heart of the issue. Um, there should be um, a powerful group led by the private sector uh, and potentially convened by the GLA, um, which could voice the concerns and the views of industrial land occupiers. Um, perhaps this group should could be uh, the existing um, the group that was convened by the GLA um, to comment on the London plan and as is being revived. Um, this group should be organizing public campaigns and open doors events um, to be increasing public visibility and understanding of industrial land. The commission is also recommending that the mayor of London uh, appoints an advocate for industrial land at a very senior level. Uh, this, for instance, could be one of the deputy mayors. And this, might say, this makes sense because the industrial land issue cuts across lots of different briefs, which can make it hard to know who to engage with. Um, and finally, local authorities uh, should be upskilling their staff, working with industrial land, um, and they should be doing this uh, thanks to support from the GLA and from the private sector um, to enable them to really develop a better understanding of uh, the needs of industrial occupiers uh, and implications for planning. We're then looking at how we can, how, how we can um, build the evidence to know uh, what types of industrial land to protect and where. Uh, and to do this, um, we need to, to develop a, a more granular and up-to-date understanding of these activities. Uh, so the commission is recommending that the GLA should use live property market data um, for its studies um, and that borrow, uh, borrows base their employment land reviews on market intelligence and audits and not just economic models and forecasts, um, which uh, as we've seen in the last few years uh, can really get out of date pretty quickly. Um, what will be crucial to help with this is for real estate companies to make industrial land market data readily available to policymakers. It is not at the moment. Um, and uh, finally, for whenever there is a plan review, uh, for them to consider housing and industrial demand together to avoid one taking the precedence over another. The commission that looked at how we manage what in the industrial land that London has left. Um, and here the view is for borrowers to really take responsibility for protecting uh, London's remaining industrial spaces uh, and use their powers to uh, full extent. So um, for instance, about a third of London's industrial space, which is not uh, protected by designation, this could be changed. We also, the commission also recommends government to uh, give borrowers more freedom to set different levels of protection uh, to reflect the different types of activities uh, that take place on industrial land and the fact that some of them are really critical um, and more than others. The commission also recommends that the government um, allows curbs to permitted development rights um, because these could create more spaces, more industrial space in places um, but they could also uh, lead to a loss of industrial spaces um, or space that is compromised um, 
uh, for instance, if housing is located right next to industrial land. Um, so there should be curves for this. Um, and finally, borrowers should ensure that new class e-premises um, meet the needs of light industrial activities. Now looking at how we boost intensification, which means getting more value out of the same amount of space. We know it won't work everywhere, uh, but we also know we need to do more of it. Um, to reduce risk, the Mayor of London should create a fund to co-invest in developments that provide stacked industrial floor space. And the Mayor of London and the boroughs should use land they own uh, for stacked industrial developments. To help um, find different ways uh, of intensifying, not all involve stack developments. It can also involve sharing yard spaces, for instance. Um, the mayor should provide case studies on how to do this. Um, and industrial occupiers can also play a role here um, on sharing good practice among peers. There's also a real challenge about making collocation work better, but we need to crack that one too. Um, and this is about, um, for instance, making sure that um, resolving concerns when locating activities next to each other, for instance, a maker space above an office or a depot near homes. Uh, this could create space for more activities and more industrial space, especially in areas where there wasn't before. Um, so to help with this, the mayor and the borough should consider subsidizing developments that provide industrial floor space in new places where it's needed. Um, and again, there's a role here for from the mayor to offer case studies on how this can be done uh, and ensure that space works for uh, both residents and, and industrial occupiers. And finally, um, there also needs to be improvements to strategic planning. Um, the commission's view is that City Hall should continue to devise London's land use strategy, um, but it should be able to do this with minimal government intervention. This is to help speed up the process and ensure that it reflects London's specific challenges and allow government to focus on uh, issues in other parts of the country. Of course, the city also relies on industrial land that's located outside the, 20, the M25, for instance, around the, the Dartford crossing. Uh, and it's likely that the London crisis will ripple across uh, its border. <coughs> Pardon me. And so um, the National Infrastructure Commission should make the case for infrastructure investment that would unlock industrial land, for instance, bringing back disused wharves or railway lines for freight and deliveries. And government should follow up with investment, which could lead to more jobs being created around the wider Southeast and also help all authorities meet their net zero carbon targets. That's it for me, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, indeed Nico. As you said at the beginning, uh, there's a lot more in the in the report. So I would urge everybody who's tuned into this um, to, to read the report in full. Can I just also point out that I think if you go into the chat and there's something just come up on the screen, we have got a little mini poll going. What do you think is the sing single biggest threat to industrial land in London? And you can choose one of four, but you can only choose one. Uh, so please do um, dive in and do that, and we'll look at the uh, we'll look at the results at the end. Uh, so we're now going to move on to our panel discussion, and let me introduce our expert panelists. So first of all, we have Rajesh Agrawal, who is the Deputy Mayor of London for Business. Thank you, Agrawal, for coming today, and thank you with, for engaging with us on this. Uh, then we have Alan Holland. Business Unit Director, Greater London at Seagro. Seagro, I mentioned, uh, were, one of, were our principal sponsor for this work. And I should just also mention Neil in Piazzi, one of Alan's colleagues who actually sat on our commission and, and was an absolutely invaluable member of it. Uh, our third member is Amarachi Clark. She is the founder of Lucoco Chocolate, which sounds fabulous, doesn't it? I've got to go and find this, uh, find this place. This is a factory, uh, a factory shop in Bermondsey. It'll be great to have the perspective of a, an entrepreneur who is an industrial occupier. And then finally, we have Sarah Carey, Executive Director for, for Place at the London Borough of Enfield. Thank you all very much for agreeing to take part in this panel. I think we've also got Nico somewhere in the background as well, so uh, he'll be there to, uh, to chip in if we need him. Um, I'm going to go first to, uh, to Rajesh, because quite a lot of what we have said in, in, in our report 
is about the role of the GLA and the role of the mayor and indeed his deputy mayors. Now, as Rajesh pointed out to me earlier, he is the deputy mayor for business, interest in industrial land spreads um, uh, across more than just the business sector. So um, I'd be very interested, Rajesh, in, in your, your view on what you've heard so far. And then I'm going to ask you a little bit about whether this leads to you having fisticuffs with Jules Pipe who's responsible for planning, because if he's trying to build houses and you're trying to promote and protect business, how do you, how do you work out the balance? But uh, let's hear your, your reactions to this. Thank you very much, Liz, uh, for inviting me here. And this is such an important uh, piece of uh, work. So thank you for doing uh, everything that you're doing. Industrial land plays such an uh, important role in supporting London's economy. It provides a mix of jobs and supports a range of sectors that are so critical to good growth. Our latest evidence shows that about 7% of all employment in London, which is about 340,000 jobs, is in industrial sectors. So, for example, a visitor to a London hotel, restaurant or a bar might enjoy a beer from one of the capital's many independent breweries or coffee from a local uh, roaster. The Kitchen might source its seasonal produce and exotic ingredients from a London wholesaler and the uh, linen and towels may be packed off at the end of the day to be laundered in one of the capital's many important industrial areas. Uh, later at a theatre, they may see stage designs, costumes and props that were built and stored at industrial sites before making their way to the stage. And I've been to many of these industrial estates across uh, London, whether it's in Park Royal, Walthamstow, Havering, Enfield. It's amazing to see how they're supporting jobs and also uh, being uh, transformed to uh, suit the needs of the economy, whether it's in logistics and film and TV production, great work in uh, Enfield. And a little birdie told me that Penelope Cruz uh, was in Elf Enfield yesterday uh, shooting for something. Um, but but look, I, I must also add that I live in outer London in, in Harrow and I know how industrial land is even more important uh, to the outer London boroughs and uh, London has been losing far too much of the industrial space. It needs not only for the uh, manufacture of goods, but also the provision of services such as just in time deliveries that uh, Londoners couldn't live without, as well as for the wholesale markets. Uh, waste processing and recycling, uh, the transport network uh, and more. So Liz, I really welcome this report from Centre of London and the really valuable contributions from all the members of the commission. The report and its recommendations really complement uh, the innovative approach in the Mayor's London plan, which promotes the uh, protection and int intensification of uh, London's important industrial land. And uh, we are working on new London plan guidance on industrial and logistics uses, uh, which will be out for consultation during the second half of the year. So I encourage everyone watching today to engage with it. So your feedback can inform the planning guidance on this uh, crucial uh, issue. The mayor is very keen to work with the landowners, industrial, uh, businesses and the London boroughs to make sure that the London plan uh, policies are implemented and he supports the projects that uh, showcase the very, uh, very viable uh, intensification of industrial land and we are fully committed to using the powers that we have uh, to protect uh, London's industrial land and working with partners so we are able to meet uh, our future industrial business needs and as far as uh, the role between so me and Jules is concerned. I think we are very much on the same page uh, on, 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 on the matters. Uh, in fact, um, uh, you might have noticed that in the draft London plan, uh, the, we were trying to take the, uh, we, we put a net zero uh, loss of industrial space approach, which sadly and unfortunately was removed by the Secretary of State. Uh, so that also shows that whilst as London, we might all be on the same page, but not necessarily the central government. So I think we need more uh, devolved powers uh, to London um, and, and for Londoners. 
And, and just one very quick follow up that, uh, on that, because I want to, to move quickly on to Alan, but uh, I probably, it was probably wrong to put Jules Pipe in the frame for, your, uh, for, for the fisticuffs, but of course, Tom Copley you know, has, to has to help the mayor deliver a huge number of, of homes. And this pressure homes versus industrial land, how, how, do, we, how do we reconcile those two? Which of course is what drove the Secretary of State to his particularly unfortunate intervention as well. Yeah. I think both are absolutely possible and one is not against the other and we have to be very careful. I mean, we've got a housing crisis and you know people mm -hmm. need houses to live and we've got to solve that. But in trying to solve that, what we don't want is end up with another problem. Uh, I, 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 I've seen how uh, sort of office blocks have disappeared into luxury flats and how petrol stations have disappeared into luxury flats. And, uh, you know, we don't want that kind of loss happening. And I think we've got to be very innovative in our approach. And we don't have to select one or the other. And both are possible uh, by use of technology, by being innovative in the, uh, in the design. Uh, I mean, you know, we talk about, you know, one of the fastest growing sectors that require uh, industrial space, amongst many others, by the way, is logistics, you know, mm -hmm. with the rise in e-commerce and so on. I mean, we could have sort of multi-story uh, sort of warehouses and so okay, on. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop you there because actually, thank you. That's a brilliant. You, you've done a brilliant introduction to the next question and and uh, the next member of the panel that I want to bring in. Now, you know, everybody knows Seagrow, Alan, as the uh, the provider of very large sheds. So, you know, on the, I, I appreciate you do more than that as well, but, you know, this is perhaps the public perception. So on the one hand, you're sort of part of the solution, but also possibly part of the problem covering uh, industrial land with, uh, with, with large sheds. How do, how do you make sure that you're actually supplying the sort of industrial premises that London needs? Well, good afternoon, Liz, and um, uh, thanks, thanks for the question. And, and firstly, let me just um, shout out and thanks to the Centre of London and the Independent Commission just um, echo the, uh, the excellent work. It's a very timely, uh, well-written, well-considered um, report. And I think judging by the interest on this webinar, we've certainly hit a few chords. So um, remiss of me not to put that on the record. So, so well done you and well done the team. Um, turning your, to your specific question, I mean, Seagrow is one of the largest owner managers of industrial in London. And we've been in this marketplace since the late 1940s. And from the very start, it's about giving the customer choice, giving the customer a range of buildings, small, medium, large. And, and you know, the, there's a real kind of misperception here on the role of industrial and the vital, vital role it serves in the vitality and strength of London as a capital city. And it happens elsewhere. Um, so we need to provide more space for customers across the spectrum in, in, in London, from SMEs through to multinationals, through to so homegrown businesses, um, in order to support the growth of London, um, particularly in a kind of sustainable net zero way. Um, so it's not just about the big boxes. Um, it's about a range of choices at different price points. Um, and it's really about um, us all seizing the opportunity now to reflect um, the position we're in and the opportunity for the role of industrials to be recognised within London. What we're about is, you know, our customers are about is serving the needs of London, whether it's feeding them, whether it's providing digital content, whether it's creative industries, whether it's logistics. Um, and, and that need in the last couple of years, you know, has just, just really increased. Mm. Yeah, d d thank you, Alan. I mean, I, th I think that's a you know that that's a very fair point that you have to look across the uh, across the piece. C can I just ask you quickly before I move on to, to Amarachi? This whole business of intensification. I mean, if I was being a bit blunt about the property industry, it sometimes takes a little while to change, you know, and, and industrial's always been sort of single story stuff that you can put up quite quick, quickly, you know, crinkly sheds, the sort that line the, the A1. Uh, the idea of intensification, we've got, we've got to think a bit smart, haven't we? We've got to, you know, we've really got to do something very different in the industry. Are we up for that? Yes, I, th I think as an industry, we're getting there. 
Um, we've got a couple within within the Seagrove family. We've got a couple of um, multi-story buildings, um, both going up and going down in Paris, and we're looking at quite a few now um, inside the M25. So I think there is definitely an inflection point where embracing change, embracing innovation, mm. and being smart about maximising floor area um, mm. is. Is, is definitely part of the solution. It's not the only part of the solution. We don't, I don't think we can pretend that all industrial buildings will be you know, several stories high across London, but it's certainly part of the solution. And, and, and do you think you could envisage a, a model where you know, one of your buildings had a mix of uses from the sort of stuff that needs big open spaces with not too much interruption at one level, ground level, and then you could move up to you know, smaller units elsewhere? Absolutely. So just before Christmas, um, working with the mayor's office and um, London Borough Barking and Dagenham, we, we've got a couple of planning consents now for exactly that type of building. Right. Yeah. Um, and it is about a range of space within um, a particular mm. envelope. And I think the other thing which was mentioned in the report, which we would um, definitely um, support, is genuine co-location. Mm. So whether that's at, at, at an estate level, at a site level, um, yeah. housing and uh, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. And I'm, I'm going to come to sort of Sarah about uh, on, on that subject, you know, from the sort of particularly from the, the local planning authority perspective. OK, um, realise we haven't got a lot of time. Um, Amarachi, um, interesting to hear Alan talking from the perspective of the, the provider of, of a, a variety of space, space, including the big space. But you're a, a small business that needs a small space, and I suspect you also want it to be affordable. Um, you're not going to be paying sort of you know top top draw top draw rents. Tell us a bit about your concerns as a small industrial producer. So I think there's there's a number of things that has been touched on, um, and that the report is amazing, and it's really it's it's really good to see for the first time really, kind of. Um, a really good look at how diverse London's industri mm. um, like kind of industrial land is taken up because you've got people like me, you know, like, we, like we spoke, like has been spoken about, you've got car mechanics and you've got me who's a chocolate maker and, you, you've, and we're kind of fighting for the same kind of places, mm. um, but n have different needs to in those places. So, um, when I was looking for somewhere, um, it is about the footage versus price versus location and versus kind of like suitability. And you have to kind of consider that as a small business, because to be to be honest with you, I started my business in my back garden. I converted kind of like business, like a second bedroom in my two bedroom flat and then a, a outbuilding in my in my house into a into a um, into a chocolate factory. And then the business started growing. So I had to move out. Um, but at that point, when so when I hear that the um, number of vacancies have gone down to about four percent, the first thing in my head is, okay, I'm in a I'm in a really nice place in Bermondsey in southeast London. I'm surrounded by like-minded um, businesses from jam to granola to honey to meat to like whatever. It's like a it's a big kind of industrial area under railway arches in Bermondsey in Borough Southwark. Um, so I'm quite lucky there, but my plans aren't to ha have a stagnated business. It's to grow my business. Therefore, I need more space. And so I think some of my concerns, and it has been playing on my mind over the last two years that I've been there, is where do I go next? Because mm -hmm. we've kind of run out of space near me and what's affordable. Um, so looking at the graph and seeing how, especially in inner London, a lot of spaces have gone, some of that is down to the the rents that are being asked for and some of that's about business rates as well and we we have to lump that in into how how businesses run because then they're, they're not in isolation so they're they're some of my main concerns um and as my business we're, we are london's first bean to bar chocolate maker we're importing cacao beans from around the world from south america from africa we're bringing those all into the uk and we're making chocolate in london we're the first company to do that and i stress that because as mentioned in the report about some businesses are there because of legacy and we started in london but as we grow 
is there space for us to stay in London because of um, rent and space and business rates? Do we have to start looking outside for um, other places to go? Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that's a, a predicament that's going to be echoed by or is being echoed by a lot of small businesses. So, so I'm going to move on to, to, to Sarah, the, the, the last of our panel, to bring us the sort of borough perspective. I mean, in, interestingly, Sarah, as you'll see from reading the report, we think there's a lot of things the GLA should be doing. But we also think there are a lot of things that, that boroughs should be given the freedom to sort out themselves because, you know, only they would have the really granular knowledge of what's needed where in their in their boroughs. Does that sort of resonate with you? Do you do you feel that that's what you're able to do? Do you need more power to do that? Do you have the skills within the within the borough to you know actually go out and sort of sort out your micro industrial strategy sort of within the overall GLA industrial strategy? Thanks, Liz. Um, hi, it's quite a, a big question, but I'm going to answer it by saying local authorities like Enfield and we really welcome this report. And as a council, we don't shy away from our role in balancing out land use across London and being part of London as a whole. Um, and I would tell Amarachi to have a look at Enfield if she's looking for um, industrial space to, to expand into. But I would say that our central reservoir, which is really well connected by transport, is, is the prices are rising quite quickly, but there's lots of smaller industrial areas in outer London, which might suit you really well. And that might have a really good, not only be suitable, but have a really good community that you talked about. But coming back to our role as local authorities, I think one of the things that is frustrating is permitted development. And it, and it, although it's really affected infield town centers over the past couple of years, um, I am worried and we are as, as a borough worried and the officers worried about what it could do to some of our industrial estates, which are suitable for conversion to residential just because they're already in a residential area. Um, and we need to protect those and have the powers to do that. Um, I would say it's not easy um, to protect and expand employment in industrial space. We, but Enfield, in our summer consultation on our draft local plan, was looking to meet all of our employment needs and to provide additional employment for space for London. Now we're looking at doing that through a mixture of um, co-location, of intensification, of protecting land, which is actually used for industrial purposes, even though it's not, it isn't that already in our plan. And, and actually looking at Greenbelt release to support um, logistics particularly. So we're trying as a borough to propose how, how to do that. It does put us, it does make for some difficult decision making. Much of our industrial land is incredibly well connected by public transport. And you, I, I you know, whether it be Rajas or Tom Copley or the deputy, you know, Jules, the deputy mayor, there are tensions in this use, um, but we're trying, uh, trying to take that responsibility on. So I would say, some of the suggestions in the report around planning are really helpful, um, more control over permitted development, and we do recognise that we've got a strong role to play. Okay, right. Th th thank you very much for those introductory answers. Th there are a huge number of questions in the Q&A, and we're not going to get through all of those, so I'm, I'm going to sort of pull some themes out of, uh, out of some of them. I mean, th there's an interesting point in one of the questions about, you know, what do we actually see as, as London's industrial future? You know, in other words, what do we what do we want London to be? And and I think that's a, a really interesting, really in, interesting question. You know, how much real industry do we want? How much do we think we need? Is it just what the people who live here need to support, immediately support them without incurring lots of mileage in moving stuff in from outside, or do we want to remain a, a, a sort of hotbed of small creative industries? I mean, Rajesh, do you, do you have a thought about, you know, what, what do you think London's industrial future should be? I think it's a bit of both because the industry is changing, the economy uh, is changing and the needs are changing and the industrial land has played a very uh, vital role in supporting London's economy so far. So it's not just the people who live around there or who work in the industrial land, but also it supports, uh, like I said before, it supports many other businesses uh, and supply chains uh, rely on these industrial sites for just in time uh, delivery and business to business uh, logistics and demand from the logistics sectors is growing. And particularly in the pandemic when it provided a lifeline for individuals who relied on online shopping and deliveries, 
and this is only going to grow. Uh, and these uh, areas also provide uh, critical infrastructure for wholesale markets, waste and recycling sites, uh, the, the uh, transport network, and so on. So we must make sure with the changing economy, uh, you know, culture and creative industries are a big part of London's economy. Again, it's a fast growing area and London's got the opportunity to be the absolute leader uh, in, in, in the world in, in that. Um, and we need space for all of that. So the industrial uh, uh, land must adapt uh, to the changing needs of the economy. And, and, and I suppose one of the interesting points there is you know, we, we've touched um, uh, earlier on, you know, the huge diversity that you, of definition in industrial land, you know, so everything from a data center to Amarachi's chocolate, chocolate factory or somebody doing doing sort of bicycle repairs. I, I mean, how far should we be trying to sort of dictate the type of industrial, because, you know, the data centers don't have a huge number of sort of supporters everybody says oh you know they're big they cover a lot of they cover a lot of area and they don't employ anybody oh and they're not very pretty either um you, you know on the other hand we can all see why we need a chocolate maker um but um you, you know how how do we how do we get that balance right between what we need who'd like to have a shot at that sarah you, you, it's probably the sort of thing you think a lot about oh we do and i would say that if you when i joined enfield four years ago we had a lot of storage and we had a lot of um, yeah, just not very creative and not very intense use of industrial space. That has changed dramatically, particularly during the lockdown. And we do have, you know, we now have very large film studios doing really creative work, but we also have more kind of active production as well as a lot of last mile logistics and one or two interestingly science based, so part of the kind of people who want to be in London but want to be able to get to Cambridge really quickly. And Enfield turns out to be a good place, good mm -hmm. place to do that. So a couple science based, um, science-based sectors. And I, I think that is the future. Planning at the moment doesn't give us any ability to drive that. And I'm, uh, I'm not, I haven't thought through, I guess, enough about how we could use that to do that. But I think there is something about focusing on the type of activity and those current land use classes are a bit loose on that. I'm not sure we want to be hugely prescriptive. I think the market in London is kind of driving us that way. I think it's about that can we Question for me is how can we help intensification, better use of the yeah. same land rather than which activities? Now there is a link in that you're gonna, you know. Yeah. But well, I, and I mean, I think you 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 raise an interesting point there. And please, if if others of the the, the, the panel would like to come in on this, because uh, in in some of the Q and A, you know, there is a suggestion that actually, how on earth have we got to this state? Is it because the planning system has actually been too lax in protecting? Uh, in protecting our industrial land. Um, the, the issue about Secretary of State overturning the no net loss policy is, uh, is an interesting one. But if you go the other way and become really prescriptive, you know, this piece of land has got to be used for this purpose. I, I think you're sort of saying that's probably not the answer. I mean, anybody like to sort of chip in on that? Alan, you know, you, you, you must come up against the planning system quite in a number of interesting situations. I think it's a case of striking the right balance. Um, mm. You know, land, land ought to be used for its most appropriate use, but having regard to future demands and needs. Um, I know the green belt is a kind of politically kind of hot topic, but there's lots of areas of land in London which are generally underutilized. Mm. They're open in mm. character, but you know, there could be a case for intensification there. Um, I think as a long-term investor in the communities and boroughs of London, I think a kind of a, an active, supportive planning policy um, is, is a really good thing. And I think there's, there's kind of a practical, you know, to get a bit granular, there's a practical bit about resourcing and getting consent through. And, you know, one of the issues around supply is, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard getting things consented, even, even if they comply with policy. So, um, you know, doing a little bit to speed it up will, would help. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're all up for that because that, that will mean, you know, more more space for businesses to thrive and grow. I think on the big question, we need to look at industrial in London as part of London, not something that sort of operates around it. Digitalisation, going digital from the analogue world, um, our consumer patterns, all our behavioural patterns over, over the last sort of, you know, two years in particular, but five and ten years, that's causing this demand supply challenge and demographics, urbanization. You know, the population in London, eight, nine, 10 million, 
it's creating more demand for goods and services. So we must look at industrial as a part of the ecosystem of this big, lovely city we're in. So just just picking up, I mean, it's an interesting point you you raised that you know quite quite a lot of the land in London is not particularly effectively used. You know, and, and if I look at my my patch at, at Park Royal, I mean we we've done work there to show you know the the areas that we think actually could be could be redeveloped and intensified because there's an awful lot of you know single story stuff that take, takes up an awful lot of space that that needn't. The trouble is with doing that, you've got a plethora of land ownerships. Um, you know, is, is that the sort of place where you'd want a local authority to come sweeping in with its CPO powers, you know, in order to, um, Sarah might be horrified on that one. You know, having no, no, we're, 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 we're doing that at the moment. We've got um, a council owns a, a sort of sections of an, of an older industrial estate and we are working with a developer to CPO the rest of it to create a more modern estate, much more energy efficient and also more, quite frankly, pleasant to work in. I think there is a strong thing about these are places that people work and they shouldn't be, they should feel like places you want to go to work into. Um, but that, and that we're, we're happy to do that. It's where we already own land though. So it's a kind of a natural extension yeah. Of, yeah. Of, of what we're trying to do. Interestingly, hands up, we, we're finding it difficult to make it uh, sacked industrial on that site, but I, I, it's not immediately adjacent to a very large road. So I think it's more tucked away and it's not kind of on a prominent site, which I think probably makes it not as well connected to the road network basically. So. There are other areas in, in, in Infield where I know uh, landowners are looking at uh, intensification and, and stacking of industrial space. So it is, it is possible, but I think we're at the beginning of that curve. And, and, and I have to bring this question in. I'm sorry, Alan, it's sort of putting the spotlight on, on, mm -hmm. on you, but it's, it's on um, uh, Amarachi's uh, behalf, which is how will Seagro support a company like the Coco Chocolate who needs something that's absolutely affordable? Because, you know, it, it, what you produce is very nice stuff, but I suspect expensive, isn't it? It's, a, it's actually a range of price points. It's, it, it is very nice stuff, perhaps not as nice <laughs> as the chocolate, but... Um, you know, we, we provide a range of space um, to you know, a range of customers, including SMEs. And, and you know, we've got a scheme in outer London in, in, um, in, in Raynham. And post the pandemic, it's been the, one of the most successful schemes that we've, we've got. 21 different businesses from food and beverage, construction materials, um, forex trading, all, all manner of things in, you know, kind of, a room the size of you know a, a garage in someone's house you know 500 600 square feet um and rent is part of that but actually the provision of the space is another part and and the space around it wellness is so important amenity is so important a sense of community for those businesses is important so where where the land is available and can be delivered then you know that, that that's really not a problem it's about providing a range of space so, so uh, Amar, actually, are, are you encouraged by what you're hearing? That you know, people are thinking about how to provide the sort of space you're going to need as your business grows. Yeah, I'm. It's 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 encouraging, um, but I think that there is still quite a lot that we need to look at in terms of not necessarily. And I think we've already mentioned it: pitching housing and industrial land against each other. And I think that. What we have is dedicated resource to look at housing within London, but we don't have that dedicated resource to really yeah. look at um, industrial land. And so London will grow. London is a very organic place. It, and so talking about what, when, when you mentioned earlier on about whether um, there should be specific sites um, just dedicated to industrial, um, to industrial use, that actually might be a good thing because at the moment um Rajesh, you mentioned that one minute um a petrol station is turned into luxury flats why is it so easy for this stuff to happen now i think that's that's a question that we need to answer um but at the same time what I love where I am. I'm in South East London. I am in Bermondsey and I love the location I'm in because I'm with like-minded people. It's just I, I have no space to grow other than moving out of London or moving somewhere where, again, the atmosphere dies. We don't have the, we are next door to a, a high rise. We have, we, we have community bonds. And so when we do start looking for new places, 
we're going to have to start looking out. And so it's it's one thing kind of providing these things on the kind of like the outskirts of London. And I say that, but I live in I live in far east London myself. So it's not a bad thing. But at the same time, it's it's about looking at um, the really, really said housing and, and it, housing is a great thing. But can we take stock of what housing is being is being built? Who's living in them? How much is empty? Who who is kind of like, what does that look like in London's future versus the industry, which we've just said, actually, those people are probably living and breathing in London already. And then we just need space to grow our businesses because we want to stay in London. So maybe looking at that housing stock and kind of moving pieces around to some of those empty places. And so we can have some more space for some land and, and so we can grow so, so, start something can grow something so, so i'm actually thank you for sort of pointing that back to um uh, back to back to rajesh because i was going to finish with him i think this will probably be sort of our, our last little round because i mean what one of the things we've said in in this report is that you know we we feel that um, you know generally speaking industrial land needs a better pr agent you know we it, it's not had it's not had enough uh, it's enough profile it doesn't get enough focus you know perhaps we should start a movement you know rajesh for our industrial lands are or something you know we you, you might not like that, but <laughs> no, I don't. Seriously, though, you know, how can we how can we get this to have a bit more a bit more focus at, at, at City Hall? You know, you, you said yourself that there are a number of people, number of deputy mayors who dabble in it. We've got Tom, we've got Jules, we've got yourself. We need somebody to champion industrial land at City Hall, as well as sort of from the in, in industry side of things. Is that realistic? Could you do that? Uh, well, we all, uh, we all must champion, but I think we are already championing industrial uh, land, including via the mayor's planning uh, policies, and we are committed uh, to doing so. I mean, we are using all the powers that we have to ensure industrial land is used strategically and sustainably uh, in a way that supports the principle of good growth and the diverse range of sectors that make London's economy work. And I think you know, all of us sort of need to come together and we've got to also realize the limited power that the, the mayor of London has on this. Um, so I think that championing has to be at all levels, uh, at the local authority level, at the sort of mayor of London GLA level, but uh, also um, at the, with the central government. And I think uh, ultimately longer term, the answer is more, more devolution. Also, I must just say two things before uh, just ending. One is it's important that we look at London in a more as one city uh, because it's got 33 local authorities plus the city of London. So you've got, thir you know, it's quite uh, 32 plus one, 33 altogether. And uh, it can sometimes be difficult. And I think it's important to, and that's why the mayor is, because it's a more strategic uh, view of London. I think that's uh, number one. And uh, second is we all sort of need to work together um, uh, in terms of, um, uh, sort of supporting businesses, and the the mayor has uh, is already investing uh, a lot uh, in in this space uh, to help help small businesses. I will also uh, suggest uh, here to Amrachi uh, to uh, to look up on uh, GLA website, and I'll send her the link. Uh, we've got a fantastic map which points out at affordable workspaces. So I'll point you in that direction. Excellent. Well, I still think I'm going to start a campaign of uh, Rajesh for industrial lands. Are. We'll see, whether, uh, see, see where, that, uh, where that actually goes. Jules won't speak to me again, but never mind. Um, OK, look, I'm, I'm going to have to draw this, uh, this discussion to a close. We could go on for hours. Uh, you wouldn't be, I mean, our commission meetings threatened to go on all day, you know, because we, we, we found uh, so much interesting stuff to talk about. I learned so much. Um, um, you know, particularly that there's a sugar mountain somewhere in that Tate and Lyle factory by the airport. Sounds, you know, worth visiting, doesn't it, to, to see, a, see a sugar mountain. But, um, I mean, we, had a, we, we found it a really valuable period at the Commission to be able to talk about, uh, talk about this subject and, you know, what we need to do to protect London's industrial future, the land that is needed to support that. Uh, we knew we weren't going to come up with the ultimate answers. Um, I think what we were aiming for was to really generate the debate. And, and I hope very much that this is now the start of the debate. I know Centre for London, once they've launched something, you know, they're, they're not going to give it up. They're going, they're going to keep on at this. 
So, you know, people who've got views, please feed them into the Centre for London. Um, we'll sort of assimilate that into sort of action plans, next steps. We'll be doing, we'll be doing further seminars. Now, now our, our wonderful technical team have just put up the uh, results of our quick poll, which you can all see. And probably that's not a surprise, is it? That the, the biggest threat is the demand for other uses of land, such as housing. I mean, I think I would have probably said particularly housing, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that is indeed the case. I mean, we have certainly seen some interesting challenges uh, in the Old Oak and, and Park Royal patch. But, but I think this just reinforces the point that we need to keep this debate going. We mustn't let this subject drop off. I, I don't think it's been high enough on people's sort of priority list. I hope this report's put it higher and we need absolutely to keep it there and to keep talking about it. Um, so please read the report if you haven't already done so. Um, read our other reports at the Centre for London. Get involved with the Centre for London. Support us in, in what we do. And one final point I have to mention before I thank our panel. Uh, this is probably going to be my last public appearance for the Centre for London because I'm actually coming to the end of my, my time as chair for the Centre. I've had a, a wonderful time. That they're, they're a group of such inspiring people, uh, lots of young people involved in the Centre with lots of sort of brilliant, brilliant ideas. So we are looking for a new chair. So anybody out there who fancies their uh, uh, fancies being the chair of London, get in touch with um, get in touch with us, uh, or get in touch with me, and I'll, I'll pass you on to our, our nominations uh, uh, committee. Um, but um, I hope the debate on many subjects, but particularly industrial land, will carry on. So finally, just remains for me to thank our panel. Um, I never feel we use a panel like this enough, you know, we never have enough time, as I said, we could have gone on for hours, but I guess people have got other things to do. Um, your inputs were all fantastic, thank you very much indeed, and a final thank you to the commissioners who took part in this, they're listed in our report, they were great fun, we had some heated arguments, but I hope we produce something that people will find valuable and thought provoking. So, enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you very much for joining us.